Um, we're talking with an incredibly important independent publisher um, that's recognized across the UK. Um, and so I'm very, very happy to introduce Becca Parkinson from Comma Press. Hi, Becca. Hi, everyone. Hi, Joe. Thank you so much for being here today. This is kind of a really exciting event for me because I've been reading comma books since since I've, it was kind of one of the first presses that got me interested in, in independent publishing. So thanks for being here. Um, so just to start, for those who, who aren't familiar with Comma, can you just give us a little bit of background on who Comma are, how they started, what your aims are, that sort of thing? Yep. So um, Comma has been going for, I think, just over 10 years now. Um, we are a not-for-profit uh, publisher based in Manchester. We're supported by Arts Council England. Um, and we specialise in the short story form um, and fiction in translation. Um, and yeah, we're, we're a team of four. Um, we are... Um, our, our aim, I suppose, is to, to, to put the short story kind of at the forefront of contemporary fiction publishing um, and, you know, through publishing our, our collections and anthologies, we hope to help people discover new authors um, and we, we like to think that we publish in quite a unique way. Um, Anyone who's kind of familiar with our books will know, um, you know, we have series where we pair authors with experts in different fields. Um, we publish translations from across the world. Um, and, you know, through our publishing, we hope to kind of identify these, these new voices, these marginalised voices from across the globe um, and bring them into the UK fiction market. Um, but Com is not just a publisher. I mean, we do um, a lot of writer development as well, or we like to think that we do. Um, we we host a lot of writing courses. We host um, a annual conference for writers in Manchester. We're actually about to um, work with Manchester Met about on a uh, publishing master's course. So we kind of have our, our um, we have a lot of plates spinning at the moment that you can imagine <laughs> for a team of four people. So yeah. Fantastic. So you mentioned that you're, you're kind of trying to put uh, short story collections at the focus of, of what you're doing. Now, why, why was that creative decision taken? Why, why not novels or poetry? Why specifically short stories? Yeah, I, I get that a lot. Like when I'm at rights fairs and um, other events and things, it's like, why are you publishing short stories? Like it's niche and then like translated short stories is like the niche within the niche and everyone's just a bit like, why would you do that? There's no money in that. And we're, all, we're just like, ha ha. Um, <laughs> I, I've often kind of spoken to the publisher about this because obviously it wasn't my decision. Um, but he kind of, um, he's always kind of seen the, um, the short story is like the answer to the great man theory. So where people say that like history is written by the great man and the hero and the conqueror and um, short stories offer like so many more perspectives that they're, they're better equipped in a way than novels to kind of give readers this access into like a new culture or a different way of life than they're kind of used to i think you know if you have an anthology of stories like we often have 10 stories in our anthologies then you're getting 10 different perspectives you're getting kind of a diverse look at a culture or a place or an idea um you know rather than this kind of one track narrative um and uh you often get characters who aren't the hero of the story or they're not like perfect you know you don't always root for them it's it's very much like characters who are on the margins who might be like disenfranchised who might not normally have a voice or an audience in like um traditional contemporary like uh what's the word uh popular fiction i suppose um so yeah it's um it's about i think the word ra the publisher uses is like democratis i can't say that word democratizing yes that's how i say it isn't it <laughs> democratizing literature um and making these voices um that are often pushed to the to the sides heard um which is you know a big way of saying that short stories are great but also you know we we're just fans of short stories at comma you know um Catherine Mansfield and uh, Raymond Carver and all the classics and um, 
the other good thing about short stories to keep banging on about short stories is uh ra also often says that they are the, the most smugglable um form of literature mm. because we're obviously publishing um from countries that maybe perhaps uh, are quite underrepresented in um british fiction so uh we've published a lot of literature from uh, gaza and sudan and uh yemen libya somalia and these short stories uh, short stories are great in terms of like you don't need a backstory or a context you're kind of just dropped straight into this this new culture and and you know you're you're crossing borders and language barriers um and uh, yeah without in, in in a novel i feel like you need a, a lot more context and a lot more you know set up and and it's funny because short stories I, I did English literature at uni but I'd only studied like American short story writers um till I worked at comma and now you know I've read literature from so many countries I probably wouldn't have otherwise I mean I'm sure you're the same if you've read comma books you probably never thought you'd read Iraqi science fiction yeah. so. <laughs> <laughs> so it's this whole thing about crossing borders and uh and making literature in translation more accessible I suppose yeah yeah I like that kind of kind of a lot of authors will kind of have these totemic novels of theirs and then kind of people view their short story collections as these side pieces yeah. but you but you actually find people can be a lot braver with their concepts in a short story because they don't feel the need to like yeah. add all this stuff to it totally yeah and yeah you you mentioned this kind of how how collections of short stories can represent a place mm -hmm. um and you have this I don't know if this is the right title for the series, but you have this, is it Reading the City? Yes, yes. Yeah, these kind of collections which are kind of embodying the plurality of cities. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, it was um, Book of Shanghai, the most recent one. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Um, could, you, could you talk through the process of like putting one of these collections together? Mm-hmm um so a bit of background about the series so we've been publishing the, the city series since about 2006 um and we if you haven't read one we uh source 10 stories from a city um and so that's 10 authors and 10 stories and we translated them into english often they're translated into english for the first time um and it's supposed to kind of um epitomize the like social historical cultural essence of that city so as you say we've done Shanghai we've also done uh, Khartoum, Gaza, Tokyo, uh, Riga, Tbilisi, uh, the list goes on. Um, in terms of putting those books together it very much starts with well other than choosing the city which is the fun part and we often actually ask our readers what cities they want to see. Um, we do a poll every year and it's quite interesting to see which, which cities come up um, and then kind of once we have an idea of a city we'll um, search out funding because the thing with being a small press is that you need funding for these projects um you know <laughs> translation is not free and it shouldn't be because translators are incredibly skilled and deserve to be paid fairly for their incredible work um so yeah choosing the city finding funding filling out the funding application that's the fun part and then um and then once we have the funding it's a case of um often finding a, a guest editor so you'll notice with our city anthologies, it's often um, uh, edited by either a, a comma editor and a, an editor who's based in that country or that city, um, or it's just edited by um, by someone like uh, Raf Cormac. He's edited Khartoum and Cairo, um, and Ursula Casagrande. So she did Havana, and she'll be doing some more for us in the future. Um, I myself um, edited two collections in the series uh, in collaboration with um, these guest editors and what they kind of bring is other than being bilingual because <laughs> I'm ashamed to say I cannot speak any other languages other than English um, <laughs> other than can. no exactly so <laughs> other than having that bilingual aspect it's they're sort of our go-between um, and our kind of um, local guide i suppose they're often very plugged into the the kind of literature scene in that country or that city and they're like great at recommending translators and authors so it, then it's just a case of working collaboratively to, to choose the 10 authors to choose the 10 stories to 
to find the translators and then and then it very much proceeds like a normal uh, a normal book in terms of you know editorial drafts um typesetting choosing the order of the stories um designing the cover so so we'll we'll fi um find photos of landmarks and you know kind of um recognizable elements of that city and we send it to our brilliant designer Dave Eckersall and he creates the kind of um series uh, style that you'll see if you um mm. if you if you look up the series you know we like to go with bright colors and so they'll all line up nicely on your shelves if you collect them um so yeah they're, they're, they're really great books to work on I mean because I worked on the book of Riga I got to go to Riga um, I'd never been to Latvia before that. I got to meet some amazing authors and um, I kind of got a tour of the city and it, it's such a beautiful, beautiful city and it really helped me kind of um, work on that project because I could see the city in my mind when I was reading the stories but I, I don't think you have had, you have to have had to go to that city. I think the stories give you enough of like a a mental picture or like a teaser that you can kind of picture it in your mind but you're also like damn I need to travel to this place <laughs> it sounds so amazing um hopefully so so yeah a bit of armchair travel is always welcome especially when you're in isolation <laughs> yeah and it's it's also nice so one of the ones I read a while ago is the book of Gaza and it obviously paints a very different picture of Gaza yeah. from what yeah. we're you know what we're told and what we're shown yeah so they yeah. can be really powerful like that those books definitely yeah how long how long is that process normally oh um i mean i guess it depends like when the funding rounds come up because sometimes there are a certain time of the year but i would say in my experience it's maybe like a year to 18 months um it is quite quick i mean we do work quite quickly we work on quite quick turnarounds as a press we publish 10 to 12 books a year but sometimes they can be dropped in very last minute like mm. um for example we published a book called banthology which some people might remember from 2018 which was in response to trump's travel ban and that book basically came about because we were having a meeting a normal meeting like boring <laughs> monday meeting and um, all of a sudden, you know, it's BBC News, Trump's banned these several countries from traveling to the US. And we were just horrified, mainly because these were countries um, where writers we worked with were based. And to kind of impose these like horrendous racist restrictions on these countries, we were just so shocked and appalled. And basically we were like, right, we're going to do an anthology in response to this ban. And then nine months later, the book was it existed. And wow. in that nine months, we'd commissioned seven new stories we'd you know translated them and then w worked with the writers on the edits and then published it you know cover and all and that was insane I mean I wouldn't recommend doing a book in nine months um, in translation don't do that but um, you know it, we are um, blessed to have the Arts Council support that we have that means we can pivot and respond to these kind of contemporary issues I think the, the book of Gaza that you just mentioned I think that came out of the war in 2014 I think in, a, in some way that was a, a bit of a response to that because we've been working with Gazan writers before it but I think that kind of gave us the impetus to to you know say there's, there's so much more going on in Gaza than what the headlines are telling you and here's mm. what it here's what it's actually like from the writers of that country and I think that's really important so yeah uh, that's it I, I really can't recommend it enough. It's an amazing book. And Banthology as well is really Thank good. You. It's really brilliant. And I had no idea it was nine months. That's, yeah. that is insane. <laughs> you, we, you normally talk about publishing in terms of like two year chunks. Yeah. Like that's, that's I quite know. amazing. I know. Can you imagine though, like the stress <laughs> also, you know, on my side when I'm doing the kind of like, okay, what are we publishing next year? And there's like a gap and I'm just like need to find something to fill that gap guys um but you know there's, there's, there's always stuff happening so so i'm sure there'll be a random anthology next year that comes out of nowhere i mean trump will probably do something else completely stupid and we'll, the next we'll horrible thing. anthology too <laughs> well let's hope not but no let's if, hope it, not. if it does happen i hope i hope you'll respond in the same way yeah so i mean my my relationship with comma it's kind of started from your Arabic imprint. Mm -hmm. um, started directly with um, Iraq Plus One Hundred, um, but how? Because given that you're 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 a British publisher, and you started with the Book of Leeds and Book of Liverpool. I think mm -hmm. that's right. Mm -hmm. How did that 
Arabic imprint come about? Um, it w- <laughs> you'll be surprised to hear it wasn't really a plan. It wasn't really a deliberate choice. Um, I've spoken to, again, I've spoken to the publisher about this because I, I joined Comma in 2016. So by then it was kind of already established as a thing. But um, it was a few things really. I mean, it's mainly kind of Hassan Blasim, who's, um, he's an Iraqi author and uh, a refugee. He's now living in Finland. But um, in 2018, we did an anthology called Medina, which was a city book, but from the Middle East. So it wasn't a specific Middle Eastern city. It was like 10 or 12. Mm. Um, And Hassan wrote the, um, I think he wrote the Baghdad story. And um, I think we would, I think the publisher was just so blown away by Hassan's writing in this one story that he commissioned a full collection, which was the Madman of Freedom Square, which came out in 2009. And then another collection, The Iraqi Christ, which came out in 2014. That's um, one of our most successful books. It won the um, Independent Foreign Fiction Prize, which is now the Man Booker International. And a an Arabic book, a short story book, had never won that prize before. So you can imagine how amazing that was for us as a small press. Um, so yeah, I guess, so it's evolving over that time. And then, like I say, the war in Gaza on, in 2014, you know, we were suddenly working with far more... Um, Gazan writers, not just fiction writers. Um, Ra, our publisher, he um, has quite a, a, a big interest in citizen journalism. So he was working with a lot of Gazan writers on pieces that you know were being published in the New York Times and, and in the UK as well. So uh, that kind of resulted in us working with At- Atef Abu Saif, who um, he wrote the drone eats with me, which is a diary of the war in Gaza. And then Atef's worked with us since, so has Hassan. We, we, we're actually publishing Hassan's novel later this year. Um, so I guess it, it is kind of, that's kind of the way we work, is, is we work with these writers, you know, on a single story, and then we love them, and then we end up working with them on a full collection, and then we kind of grow and evolve together, the writer and the publisher. And now I think we have a dozen or so titles under our Arabic imprint, um, so to speak, you know, like I mentioned, um, we've done um, Cairo and Khartoum with with Raf Cormac editing those, and Rania Mamoun, who's an amazing Sudanese writer, we published last year under that imprint. So, so I think it, it, it's really exciting. We, we, we're kind of um, oh, not unearthing because I hate that word because it, it it makes it sound like they weren't there before you kind of discovered them, but we're 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 getting to work with these amazing you know um exciting writers from arabic like rania like nehruz um like hassan who you know is now you know a greatly established writer you know he's published in 22 languages but he still he still wants to work with us which is very nice um even though his book is published by penguin in america which is kind of crazy so so yeah that's kind of how it came about and and i don't think it'll go anywhere anytime soon you know we're as we speak working on arabic translations uh, we've just got funding to do the book of Ramallah which is going to be really interesting because obviously the book of Gaza came out six years ago so I think it'll be quite an interesting kind of um, sister anthology to that book mm. so so yeah we'll see yeah someone someone you mentioned in that this is uh, Nairuz Kamu yes and that was so for anyone anyone who's <laughs> background I, I used to work at the Edinburgh International Book Festival and um, we hosted Nairuz Kamu last year um, with her book, The Sea Cloak. Um, it's, it's an absolutely amazing book and it had a massive impact on the festival last year. What, what was the process of, of bringing that book to us and the kind of response that has come after? Yeah, I mean, unlike Bamphology, which took nine months, I think that book took five or six years. Um, we we found Nehru's through Atef, so she was one of Atef's uh, creative writing students, um, and we um, she was it, she was also in the Book of Gaza. So it was the very similar with Hassan, where we'd read her story in the Book of Gaza and thought, oh wow, she's got so much potential. That's great. Let's work on a full collection. So we worked with Nehru's and the translator Perwin Richards, who's actually an emerging translator as well. So it's quite interesting to have a debut writer paired with an emerging translator on this book. And um, yeah, I mean, we didn't, we hoped the book would do well, um, but we were a bit worried because we'd had to delay it so many times because 
we we tried to get Nehru's to the UK to launch the book I think five times and every time had our visa request rejected for really like random reasons like uh, the Rafa border being closed, um, like the Home Office saying like, oh well there was a discrepancy in the accounts or whatever, really random reasons. Um, and it was only with the help of Edinburgh Book Festival that we actually managed to get her to the UK in 2019 um, because they pulled some strings for us and got this visa approved and got her fast-tracked, you know, out of Gaza because it's an incredible journey to undertake. Um, just leaving Gaza, never mind getting to the UK. Um, and we got her to, to Edinburgh. No, it would have been 2018. So she, she visited in 2018 for the first time and then again last year. Um, and it was amazing. I mean, when she came in 2018, I don't think we had copies of the book. I think she was just kind of talking about her experience, if I remember rightly. And then last year, when we actually launched the book properly, it, the support we got from Nick and the festival was incredible. I mean, they paired her with Camilla Shamsi for an event, which I think for any debut writer must be um, incredible and also terrifying because Camilla is just amazing. And we ended up, um, The Sea Cloak was the best selling book of the festival last year, which for a small press is just absolutely incredible. And um, I think shows the power of, you know, arts and culture to, to kind of influence government decisions and also when you know you have presses and festivals working together you know on on these books that we feel are, are so important and, and powerful mm -hmm. as you say um it it was honestly a, 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 a huge pleasure to work with edinburgh on on that whole thing and and i'm really happy for nehru's that her, her debut's gone down so well so so yeah mm. yeah it was it was quite it was quite an amazing sense on site. I don't know if you came to the, the site. I didn't make year. it, but Ra did, yeah. It was it was amazing. And certainly in the in the bookshop, it was like every time I walked through the bookshop, I could guarantee someone was gonna pull me aside and where's the sea cloak? Where's <laughs> like and so I just I carry I'd around stacks there. of them. <laughs> it was the first time I've ever hugged a box of books when they arrived, I think. I was so, I was just had this fear that it was gonna something was gonna happen. And yeah, yeah. Yeah, was, I know the was, feeling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so an another book we talked about um, that you mentioned was uh, Iraq Plus 100. Yes, um, yes. Which, like I said, that was my introduction to Comma Press. That was my introduction to Iraqi sci-fi. Um, yeah, I think it was yeah. many people's introduction to Iraqi sci-fi. Mine too. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, and you've now, I think it's already published. Could you tell us a bit about Palestine Plus 100? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, um, so as you say, Iraq Plus 100 was published in 2016. That was our bestseller that year. Um, it, um, if anyone doesn't know it, imagined Iraq 100 years after Britain and America invaded. Um, and uh, it's edited by Hassan Blasim, who, as I've said, is an Iraqi author. Um, and he'd kind of seen this younger generation of Iraqi writers, not just in Iraq, but in the diaspora as well, um, kind of overturning these um, traditions that had been established in Iraq because of decades of censorship. I mean, Hassan had to flee Iraq himself because he was uh, publishing some plays and stories which the Iraqi government did not deem appropriate. Um, so he literally had to flee to Finland to kind of escape the censorship. So, so that book was born out of that basically. Um, and uh, Basma Galini, who is the editor of Palestine Plus 100, was aware, aware of the Iraq project. She's worked with us a couple of times because um, she's an Arabic translator. And she kind of thought, you know, that um, Palestine having this similar, like, um, you know, life changing event in terms of, so like the Nakba happened and, you know, life in Palestine has never been the same since. And it influences so many, you know, generations of writers. She kind of thought like, well, well, if Iraqi writers can address, address the invasion, then Palestinian writers can address, address the invasion as well. Um, so, so yeah, she kind of pitched, let's do Palestine plus 100. And we were like, yep, why not? We've got, you know, all of these amazing Palestinian writers we already work with and happy to find more. So, so we, we did a call out basically in Arabic and English asking for stories um, written 100 years after the Nakba. And we got an amazing response. It was it was fantastic. So we we, we whittled it down to twelve stories, um, and they kind of 
as you say, some of them are very sci-fi, you know, like virtual reality and like um, high tech kind of future matrix style. But then there's also, you know, a lot of dystopian fiction in there. There's, a, there's some magical realism. Uh, Mars and Maru's story in there is particularly off the wall and kind of crazy um, if anyone's read it. But yeah, it's, it's using that kind of future setting to explore what's going on in Palestine now because uh, you know I've never visited but I've spoken to a lot of our Palestinian writers and living in Palestine now is basically a dystopia so it's not really a massive leap of the imagination to imagine you know the atrocities that they're going through and just adding in you know futuristic elements like aliens and ufos and and those sorts of things um and again it was our best-selling book of last year and so it shows that there's this this interest from you know western readers um in this arabic sci-fi and, and and arabic sci-fi is a genre in itself that's only just emerged in the last few years i mean we've just done a podcast episode about it um where we where we discussed you know how um how it's it's just emerging and there's just all this amazing exciting um sci-fi coming out of the middle east at the moment and uh i think it's just been great timing that we've had these two anthologies and um we're definitely going to do more plus 100 uh, 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 i can't use words plus 100 <laughs> anthologies in the future um so so yeah keep an eye out for that if you're if you're enjoying that series then then there's more coming so yeah there it's a really kind of remarkable and like innovative way of of reading about a different culture and i think i said it in my um i did a little review of iraq plus 100 for publicate and said it you know i probably learned more from that book about yeah. the experience of iraqi people um than i did from all the news coverage we've had yeah and i think part of that is the amongst all the dystopia there is this these kind of seeds of hope and these yeah. kind of visions for the future of these these places totally, yeah. which is it's amazing it's an amazing thing to have published yeah i mean like i'm the same i like was incredibly ignorant about these conflicts and especially the nakba i to my shame had never heard of the nakba before we did this book and you know i'd like to think i'm quite an educated person i went to university i studied history but it's not something that we really cover on like any kind of syllabus or curriculum in the uk and speaking to Basma and reading her introduction, I mean, if you want to know about this book, um, Basma's introdu introduction, which we published on our blog, is um, it's amazing because it, it, it speaks to her experience as um, a woman who's grown up in Palestine and lived between Palestine and the UK and has family there still. Um, but just how, like, deep rooted the kind of tragedy and the trauma of the Nakba is for the people of Palestine and and you know we did get a bit of flack when we published that book nothing extreme or anything but you know there is a lot of debate around Palestine and, and the Nakba and the occupation and everything but you know I, I, I feel like I know so much more about what's going on now that I've read that book even though it's sci-fi because you would think sci-fi oh it's so silly like as a genre i wouldn't but some people would um some people would say like how can you learn about such a like meaningful issue through sci-fi but like you say you do end up picking up little seeds of hope and like um learning about the conflict and, it, and it's good to learn about it from the people who've experienced mm -hmm. it rather than you know a western journalist or something who you know thinks they know what they're talking about <laughs> <laughs> think they know what they're talking about yeah no shade from there <laughs> no no none at all <laughs> so you mentioned you mentioned the corner press podcast um which i when you pointed it out to me i hadn't heard of it until you emailed me about it um and i absolutely devoured Yay! the whole first series <laughs> and so you're on your you're midway through your second series now yeah. which is um has the kind of umbrella title of futures mm -hmm. um could you talk to me a bit about the the genesis of the podcast and what the reception's been yeah definitely because the podcast is my baby i'm very proud of it um 
so so I'm a bit of a podcast addict myself um and we were in 2017 we were publishing an anthology called protest um which for anyone who who doesn't know it's an anthology where we paired authors with historians and crowd scientists and eyewitnesses to write about British protest movements so the stories in there about uh, the poll tax riots and the suffragettes and the peasants revolt and so on and so forth it's it's a brick of an anthology um, and yeah, we, we did this anthology and, and we were watching these email discussions go back and forth between the authors and the people, the historians that they were paired with. And they were fascinating email threads. Like we should have published them just as they were like these emails. And we were like, how do we, how do we make this accessible to the readers? Because you can read the stories and the afterwards in the anthology, but there's so much more that was going into the stories and people could see. And, I, and we were just like, why are we not doing a podcast? Because pod, like, podcasts were a thing by 2017, but you know, it was still an emerging thing in publishing. Like not all publishers had a podcast at that point. And so we were like, let's just put these discussions on audio because it's not just like that they're really interesting conversations. It's like oral history. You know, these people who have taken part in these protests you know and i don't know if some of them had ever had their experiences recorded before and i'm a bit of a history geek so i was you know in my element podcasts and history yes um and you know we recorded the first episode and we had juliet jacks and m temple malt who's a historian and louise walwyn who's an amazing poet and activist who she actually took part in the section 28 protests in manchester there's an iconic photo that's ian mckellen at the front of the protest like carrying the banner and louise is like next to ian mckellen in this photo and i was just like oh my god this is so cool <laughs> um so after we recorded the first episode i was like i think we're on to something i hope um and yeah so the first series was focusing on the protest anthology it was these you know discussions about the protests themselves but also how they've kind of had a legacy up to the present day so like um uh, we did um one about or grieve and obviously you know the impact of the miners strikes is still felt in a lot of communities today um same with suffragettes you know we, we talked about how feminism and women's rights and that sort of thing is still going on today um and it was it was it was brilliant i was really happy with how it was received and how um we covered quite a lot of issues in in the first series in only six episodes um so then it came to series two and we were kind of like well it's like quite convenient really that so many of our titles this year have this kind of future looking um thread i guess through it so um i mean they're not all current titles we, in the new series we talk about iraq plus 100 palestine plus 100 we talk about our europa anthology which just came out um we're going to have an interview with m john harrison who's a sci-fi speculative fiction uh, new wave author so so it's less looking at one book in a really like um deep dive way it's more looking across our list at, like you say futures um because you know we were just really fascinated about all these new ways of looking at the future you know um sci-fi has often been very dominated by american british writers normally men um and we had you know iraqi and palestinian and european women writing their futures and they're so broad and so different and um yeah we were just like futures that makes sense um let's do that and and you know the future is is an, is an unknown it's not been um colonized or monopolized or decided yet it's it's so open to interpretation that we thought it would make a really cool podcast topic um and yeah i hope i hope if anyone's listening to series two they're enjoying it and uh, there's more to come if you're if you're watching this now <laughs> go yeah, and subscribe I, please <laughs> <laughs> yeah i can i can definitely vouch for its quality it's certainly if you're like i'm a bit of a nerd when it comes to publishing and like it's such a dream to have to basically have a publisher go through their list yeah. and just break down their their titles how they intersect how they kind of support one another like yeah because you kind of get a behind the scenes as well about how the books came together yeah. and like because they're often hosted by ra who's our publisher so he kind of gives the kind of 
here's how this happened and then then you have the the authors and the historians and everyone else like doing the kind of like um intelligent discussion about the kind of wider context so so yeah if you're if that's what you're into then hopefully hopefully it's for you and i hope we'll do more series in the future fingers crossed i think i'd quite like to do another historical one about our resist anthology which is mm. uh, the sequel to protest but we'll see yeah so anyone anyone who's interested in in the podcast i'm going to leave a link in the bio to this bio of publicate so you can check Thank it out you. i really really recommend it it's fantastic <laughs> so something i'd I'd quite like to talk about um, is uh, Cormac Press are one of the leading figures in the Northern Fiction Alliance. Um, for anyone who doesn't know what that is, could you mm. talk us through uh, what the Northern Fiction Alliance is and why it's needed? Yeah, so um, the Northern Fiction Alliance is a sort of publishing collective uh, that we set up in 2016. Um, and the, cult, the, the kind of overarching aim is to kind of showcase um, how amazing Northern independent publishers are because, you know, um, we're not all just publishing the same thing. There's incredible diversity and creativity and a lot of risk taking um, within the Alliance. I mean, just to name a few, a few members, you've got um, Dead Ink, Blue Moose Books, uh, People Tree, um, you know the list goes on we've, we've got around a dozen uh, publishers in the alliance now and and it, it started off as as a kind of um exercise in getting northern publishers onto the international stage because it was initially funded by an arts council um international showcasing grant so the point of it was to to take northern publishers to these international book fairs like frankfurt and uh, book expo in new york and and sell our rights to to foreign publishers and, and therefore you know make the international audiences aware of what we were producing in the north of england and that was a great thing and it was su supposed to be initially more trade facing and then all of a sudden people were like picking up on this idea you know we had a logo and you know northern fiction lions and people there was just such a buzz about it. I think because publishing has been so London centric for so long and for people to see this collective of independents like banding together like Three Musketeers style, it was very like, um, I don't want to say inspiring because that sounds incredibly big headed, but like exciting, I guess. Because um, I think it was quite new and seemed as quite radical that we were all working together. You know, people were like, but your competition. And it was like, well, we're not really because we all have such different specialisms and different audiences and we're stronger working together than we are working against each other. Um, and the whole point was to show that the North of England is like this hive of creativity. And, you know, you don't have to look to London exclusively for great fiction. Um, and, and so it's kind of evolved beyond this like trade facing, right selling exercise. And, you know, we've, we've done events together. Um, we've set up a mentoring scheme, we've shared contacts, we've shared resources, we've done workshops, we've um, done road shows um, in various bookshops around the UK and yeah it's it's been amazing I, as someone who's very proudly northern and very proud to work in publishing in the north I've enjoyed working on it immensely um, it's it's been a shame really because we were going to apply for more funding to kind of um, make it even bigger and better and then obviously um, corona happened um, and ruined that um, I mean hopefully once everything returns to some semblance of normality we can we can um, you know get the engines firing again on the Northern Fiction Alliance and you know do more events and and workshops and that sort of thing you know we still all talk to each other all the time there's a there's a few WhatsApp group WhatsApp groups um, you know a bit of emailing here and there so so yeah it's 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 a great thing i'm really really glad that we were kind of there at the start of it and i think it is something that um that will continue and grow and hopefully as more publishers appear in the north the alliance will just grow and grow i mean uh, just over the last few months we've seen these big london publishers establishing these regional offices which is amazing to see and and who knows who knows where we could be you know a year from now or five years from now so yeah yeah it's been it's been really nice to see because like like london centricism has been an issue in publishing for yeah 
well, it's forever, really. And so, do do you feel that there is the the NFA are like are starting to make change? Are you starting to see changes in people's approach to publishing up north? Yeah, I mean, I'm personally quite optimistic. I mean, the fact, like I say, the fact that two of the big five publishers are opening offices in Manchester, like mm. a few years ago, you would have been like, no way, that's insane. Like, and I think the industry as a whole is changing so rapidly. You know, the the, the rise of podcasts, uh, the decline of eBooks, the, the changing market, the fact that there's, you know, indies seem to be dominating awards lists now. I mean, more medium sized indies rather than small indies because prizes is a whole nother thing we should talk about in a different, <laughs> different event. But um, yeah, I mean, I think the industry has a long way to go. I think reports recently have shown that it's still majority um, overwhelmingly white middle class London based. Um, so there's still a lot of work to be done in terms of diversity, regional and otherwise. Um, and I think we're still talking about issues that were being talked about, you know, 15, 20 years ago, which is a shame. But I think that lockdown and these reports are kind of showing that people are sitting up and listening and there is more scope for remote working, people working from home, people working from the north instead of having to go down to London because I think there's such a talent drain um, of people having feeling they have to go to London because I was in that same position five, six years ago where I was at uni and I was told, well, you'll have to go to London to get a job in publishing. And I was like, no, I'm not going to London. Um, <laughs> and I've been very lucky that I have got this this role in Northern Publishing. And I think we need to make it more accessible for the kind of next generation of talent coming up. So, so I, I try to remain optimistic that, you know, over the next five years, we'll see more significant change, more regional, more regionality, more regional difference, um, more flexible working, more diverse workforces. Um, fingers crossed. I hope so. Yeah. And this, this kind of next generation of, of publishers you know that also kind of includes another generation of writers mm -hmm. coming through and you said at the beginning that you know comma are more than just a publisher you have this kind of quite extensive outreach program yeah <laughs> um, could you tell us a bit more about about what some of those schemes are and kind of how our audience can access them if they would want to yeah definitely so um we run quite an extensive program of uh, short story writing courses, which pre-COVID were in different English cities um, and now during COVID are online. But I think the online thing is something that we're going to continue on post-corona. Um, so, you know, if you are a writer kind of looking to, to write short fiction for the first time, or maybe you're a short fiction writer who just wants to develop your craft a bit, um then yeah definitely check out our courses um and we also as i said at the start we run this annual conference for writers which is the national creative writing industry day um i think it's our sixth sixth or seventh year hosting that conference in manchester um this year possibly not in manchester because of what i've already mentioned but um but yeah that's normally a, a full day where we have a keynote speech by a writer and then we have panels and workshops uh, plus one-to-one -one pitching sessions with agents i think it's going to take some kind of online form this year but it's usually the first weekend in november so yeah sign up to our newsletter or check out our website for more information about that if you're a writer who's looking to pitch to agents or just enjoy a full day of talking about writing um and we also uh, a couple of years ago we also set up a short story prize which is called the Dinesh Aliraja prize for short fiction uh, and we set that up with the University of Central Lancashire and Northern Soul magazine and that is a, basically a free to enter writing competition um you send us a short story between 2000 and 8000 words and um we have uh, a, we we have a shortlist which we then send to our judges and they pick a winner and the winner wins 500 pounds but the shortlist are all published in an ebook anthology by us so um that was a a, a way of celebrate so dinesh was a a board member of commerce he was a uclan lecturer he was a brilliant writer and he sadly passed away 
far too young um, in 2014 and we set this prize up in memory of him but we also wanted to make it a really open and accessible writing competition that's why it's free that's why we have a, a, a theme every year so this year it's home but we try not to put too many restrictions on you know what you write about so I think home is quite a, a wide brief for a writer I'm not a writer myself but I imagine that's you know yeah. quite a fun theme to take on um and yeah i mean as well as all that we we do a lot of work with emerging translators we do um we we often record our events or master classes and we upload them to our youtube channel so i guess if you're a writer and you're just looking for some resources then go to our website which is commapress.co.uk and there is a whole resources section um or go onto youtube and type in comma press or yeah i mean i can't believe sometimes i forget how much we do and then it comes to like when we write the arts council bids or reports and we're like how have we done all this stuff um in like however many months but you know it's, it's such a pleasure and we, we have found some brilliant writers you know through the whole point is it's supposed to be kind of a, a way of us finding new writers to include in our in our anthologies so oh. um so as an exercise in that, it's, it's worked very well. But hopefully we've helped some writers along the way. I think we've had some success stories, you know, people running, winning short story competitions and ending up in other publishers' anthologies and stuff. So, so fingers crossed, it's, it's a good thing. Yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't joking when I said it's an extensive list. It's an amazing, it's an amazing thing. <laughs> really, it's really, really exciting that you're doing so much. Thank you. Um, so the, the last thing I'm going to ask, because I, yes. I won't keep you all afternoon, but... Um, what what's next for comma what what can we expect in the pipeline oh lots as you can tell um yeah we've got our industry day in november we've got um we've got some new anthologies coming out at the end of the year so we're doing um we're doing a new horror anthology called the new abject which um is going to be incredibly creepy and if you're into that sort of thing you'll love it um it's got some amazing horror writers in it we're also as i say we're publishing uh, hassan blasim's debut novel god 99 that's going to be really exciting and we're also doing a new book of the city which is the book of jakarta um which should be really interesting because i have never read any indonesian fiction and i'm sure a lot of other people haven't so um that takes us to the end of the year and then maybe we'll have a break. Um, <laughs> have a day off. Have a day off. Well, there'll be, there'll be more podcasts. There'll be more events, hopefully, once events start again. Um, there'll be more online courses. There'll be more ebooks. There'll be more of everything. Like I say, sign, <laughs> I think the best way to stay up to date with what we're doing is sign up to our newsletter um, because it, you get a newsletter every couple of weeks with everything that we're doing. So it's quite extensive. But. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been great. It's been great talking to you, Joe. Thank you so much for having You're me. You're very welcome. Thank <laughs> you so much for having, for, for coming on the show. Um, and yeah, so for, for everyone who's, who's listening, if you, and all of the links that um, Beck has mentioned, I'll, I'll post in our bio. Um, I really suggest you check them out. Um, but Becca, thank you so much. It's been a, a real pleasure to talk to you. Thanks Bye everyone. Now. Bye. <laughs>